sintonize-se no Nova Consumer Podcast, uma série de conversas sobre direito do consumo. Welcome to the episode 15 of the third season of the Nova Consumer Podcast. Today we are talking with Luigi Buonanno, visiting professor at the Nova School of Law this semester, responsible for a course on law of online platforms in our master's degree in law and technology. Luigi Buonanno holds a PhD in business and social law from the Bocconi University, where he is also a postdoc researcher. He is a junior executive editor of the Italian law journal and several other journals. My name is Hatice Bilge Demir, researcher and intern at the Nova Consumer Lab. And today I am with George Maurice Carvalho, director of the Nova Consumer Lab. Welcome aboard, Professor Luigi. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, let's start with the quick part. A time of particular difficulty for jurists, where the guest must answer quickly about himself. And let's go. Uh, Milena or Lisbon? Uh, I would say Lisbon. Uh, Hi. <laughs> because uh, actually, yes, uh, currently I live in Milan, but I come from Napoli and I honestly, I find uh, some similarities between these two cities and Lisbon is a very friendly city. So yes, and this, is my, this is my opinion. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your favorite piece of European Union legislation. Uh, well, I would say also for the import, because the importance of this act, the directive on unfair terms in consumer contracts of, uh, five, of 5th of April 1993, uh, it is one of the cornerstones of the European private law. And honestly, this act paved, paved the way for the so-called Europeanization of national legal orders. So it is really important and one of the most prominent acts in the European private law. And if you were a legislator for just one day and you were <laughs> assured of its approval, what legislation would you create? Interesting question, thank you. If I were a legislator, maybe I would focus my attention on the activity performed by credit bureaus in the credit markets. Uh, in doing so, I would pay attention to the European and the US legislation on the credit rating agencies whose uh, activity is also entwined with the need to assess the credit worthiness of specific subjects. I do really believe that there is a need to carefully reflect upon the need to introduce um, a regulation for um, this kind of entities that are so the credit bureaus. And what is the myth in relation to online platforms that you most need to clear up at family dinners? Uh, well, I would say that online platforms sometimes, uh, as uh, we know, are giants and the common feeling is that they are not really uh, regulated. Uh, however, there are also very small platforms which needs, uh, which need to be considered and sometimes uh, protected. So we have on one side, big, very large, very large platforms. However, we have small platforms uh, whose activity must carefully uh, considered. And do you prefer shopping online or in a physical shop? Uh, in principle, uh, I would say physical shop, but honestly, more often I opt for online shopping. <laughs> <laughs> it is easier sometimes to exactly this is the shop, uh, shop online especially exactly. nowadays and you have more options also. but from a romantic point of view i would yes. say <laughs> physical shop <laughs> touch the goods to touch the goods is always exactly exactly magical. <laughs> thank you so much for this uh, first part of our episode 
We now move on to the second part of this uh, episode in which the answers can be developed a little, a little further. Let's start. Why your interest in online platforms? Is there an interesting story you would like to share with us on this topic? Um, thank you for, for this uh, question. Uh, I think that the online platforms uh, activity raises uh, interest for several reasons. Uh, primarily the concrete, relevant, the concrete relevance that this activity has uh, on our daily life. Uh, and this is to some extent self-evident. Uh, this point is intertwined uh, with a second reason. Uh, very, very often we realize that this activity is underregulated, both at supranational and national level. And so in the current scenario, online platforms act sometimes as private uh, regulators, as private legislature, so the need to adapt the legislation, there is a need, in my opinion, to adapt the legislation to the modern reality. Uh, and this is an intriguing challenge for uh, jurists. Uh, and this is what happens with specific platforms, uh, which, for example, resorts um, to blockchain technology. Uh, several platforms, several problems stem uh, from the need to understand if the modern private law categories, so fault or strict liability, the formation of contracts, remedies, are fit for the purpose. Uh, and these topics are, today are widely discussed by the scholarship, by the doctrine. So, and not only, not, not only from a legal perspective, because they are exactly. getting from stronger than many states, for instance, the, some of the, of, of the platforms that we are dealing with nowadays. For sure, for sure. Yeah, this is a topic which is really discussed also from an economic point of view, from a technology point of view. So, uh, And I would say a political point of view. A political point of view. We need to face, we need to face, do know how to face the, some of these very large platforms using the, the wording of the, of, the, of the Digital Markets Act and the Digital exactly. Services Act. Exactly. exactly. Um, and do you think that online platforms shape our lives and businesses? Again, thank you for this question. Um, yes, I think that this point is also self-evident or quite evident our daily lives are increasingly influenced by online platforms. They play a role in several in different areas of our lives. Think about Facebook, Spotify, Uber, Google, Airbnb. Um, honestly, I do not have the data, but I believe that there's no person who has not used an online platform at least once in their life. Platform, um, from, from our point of view, uh, platforms also influence academic life. Uh, this is the case of specific, specific platforms, thanks to which uh, it is possible to make, for example, articles, papers accessible to all of those who are interested in. So, uh, yes, I think that the answer to this question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. And the uh, how to regulate digital platforms? One million, one million dollar question. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I will try to, to answer. It is really it is not easy to, to, to answer, but well, the method of the legislation is in this sector is, as you may know, really, really discussed. The problems arise from the nature of the activity, uh, of the activities of online platforms, which are not confined to national borders. Uh, trying to summarize the issue, we can say that the alternative about a potential legislation on this subject is between a, a bespoke regime or a detailed regime and a principle-based approach. 
Uh, the former provides for detailed regulation at supranational level. At, accordingly, a uh, narrower uh, space of judicial discretion would exist. The latter, so a principle-based approach allows to conceive the general provisions which encapsulate the common core of the laws of the member state and um, create the conditions for it to be applied at the European level, especially by the Court of Justice. Uh, a wider space for a judicial discretion from this point of view is possible, is conceivable. We uh, also need to consider that uh, it can be difficult to conceive, to imagine one single piece of legislation which proves suitable for the regulation of all the activities of these platforms. Uh, for example, is a bespoke regime, is a detailed regime up to discipline both Google and Uber? Uh, for this reason- Good question, they are so different, so, so yeah. different in all aspects. Yeah, exactly. So uh, maybe from a general point of view, I would say that uh, a principle-based approach can be preferred, but I mean, this is just uh, first. And then it's not so easy to apply. It's not so easy to exactly. apply in, in certain cases. It is easier if we have a, a more clear and uh, especially for the regulators, for the entities that uh, that need to 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 apply yeah. the the provisions. At least in Portugal, I feel that it is much easier to apply and to for the for the provisions to be respected if they are more. Um, Precise, precise in the, yeah, yeah, in, the, yeah. in the way. So, but I agree with you. I agree with you that the yeah. principle-based pr approach is uh, always preferable because um, it can uh, it, yeah, can, it solve can solve problems that are not uh, already uh, known. Exactly, and in some cases, this approach can cover diverging activities performed by online platforms. So uh, as the case I've mentioned, uh, the activities uh, of Google and the activities of IBM B or the activities of Uber and the activities of IBM B. So um, yes, but I mean, there's no one single uh, answer to this question. There are positive aspects stemming from a bespoke or detailed regime and positive aspects stemming arising from a principle-based approach. And my next question is about consumers. Are consumers protected, protected in digital platforms? Well, if we link the consumer protection to digital platforms, uh, uh, yes, this is an issue which is, again, highly discussed at the European level, uh, trying to be concise, I would say that if this sector, as highlighted by uh, several orders, uh, uh, is currently under-regulated and very large platforms uh, act uh, sometimes act as a private regulators or as gatekeepers, and this word is mentioned by the digital market Markets Act, so in this proposal for a regulation of the EU, well, potential lack to consumer protection can exist. Obviously, we, we, we will be called to assess the future impact of Digital Services Act, of the Digital Markets Act. Well, with regard to, with specific regard to the contract concluded between professionals and consumers via the platforms, through the platforms, uh, the existing regulation on consumer protection still applies. So um, the problem, we, we need to, to, to understand that there is a problem when we link the topic of consumer protection to the online platforms environment. So from this specific point of view, maybe, maybe a potential lack of protection can, 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 exist. Uh, what are your views on the Digital Services Act? 
uh, in my opinion, the Digital uh, Services Act is a good uh, step forward. Uh, the proposal, which is, uh, let's say, part of the digital single market strategy launched in 2015, maintains the liability rules uh, for providers of intermediary services set out in the uh, e-commerce uh, directive uh, by now established as a foundation of the digital economy and uh, uh, functional instrumental to the protection of fundamental rights uh, online. But do, uh, you think, do, you, do you think these uh, rules and these provisions of the e-commerce directive were taught, were, if the legislator in 2000 <laughs> knew yeah knew the, the, the impact that the new, these new digital platforms would have, do you think they would want to apply those rules to the um, to, to digital platforms? In this respect, there is a sort of distinction between the activities of very large platforms and let's say small platforms, because we know that the Digital Services Act maintains uh, the liability distinction regarding the activity of service providers. So mere conduit, uh, catching and hosting, right? In my opinion, uh, uh, we need to understand um, the uh, concrete activities of online platforms because sometimes, and this was the case of Uber, Uber um, does not act as an intermediary. And we know that the e-commerce directive relates to the activity of intermediary. And so uh, let's say that this kind, uh, this piece of- like even a platform like Amazon, for instance, yeah. are they hosting? I, do they provide host services? It, it, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, yeah. I, can, if I can agree with, uh, with this kind of interpretation, for instance, but yeah. probably we, we are moving on uh, to different solutions now with the Digital Services Act, probably, in yeah. case like the Amazon. There are some specific provisions uh, destined to regulate the discipline, the activity of, let's say, I, I think also Amazon will be involved. I don't know if we'll be considered as a very large platforms. It depends on sp specific parameters, but yes. uh, as far as I know, there are some specific provisions um, that will be applied only to the activity of uh, la very large online platforms. Perfect, yes. uh, and so there is from this, in this respect, there is a distinction between uh, the e-commerce directive and the digital services act, because I mean, that kind of regulation. So the e-commerce directive uh, did not consider this kind of, obviously this kind of, uh, we didn't have at the at that time this kind of platform. yeah and i would say that the digital services act is uh, even if it's not clear is also intertwined with the digital markets act because these very large online platforms can act as get gatekeepers and so <laughs> yes we we have we need to to, to consider this 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 uh, activity and the the, the specific uh, uh, yes, activity of Let's this kind what of, <laughs> yeah, exactly, of online platforms and distinguishing them between very large platforms, small platforms, and micro platforms, and, and so on. Let's see, we'll, it will be approved soon, I think, so it, and it would be applicable in not so many, so much time, uh, so I think, so I think we, we need to to be to be aware of this uh, of these issues we yeah. all and that's why also we all also wanted to discuss this topic in this uh, this episode of the yeah. of the podcast yeah. changing a lot the subject <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe your experience in lisbon and in portugal in the in the last months uh, my experience in Lisbon was exciting, was amazing. Uh, Lisbon, as I said, is a vibrant and beautiful city. 
uh, in my opinion, it has a sort of nostalgic soul. At least this was my feeling. So that, uh, so that is the word. Yeah, uh, I the miraduras, uh, the miraduras. Sorry for my Portuguese. Uh, Perfect Portuguese. <laughs> are, are amazing. I also visited Sintra, which uh, is uh, fantastic. A very beautiful. Uh, full of history and <laughs> surrounded by greenery. It's amazing. So I'm very, very happy to of this experience. Uh, and so we, you would recommend for... Yeah, absolutely, yes. Students uh, and... Uh, I will recommend and, uh, researchers to come. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. I, I had uh, amazing uh, months there. So thank you for, for the invitation again, because I was very lucky. So... Great. And what about the Nova School of Law? What were your... Uh, with regard to... Our faculty. Yeah, with regard to Nova School of Law, honestly, I was uh, very impressed by the international... First of all, by the international environment and the high level of the faculty, the teaching staff. Um, I spent my... I used to spend my time at the university with other colleagues who gave me a wonderful welcome. So I was lucky also in this respect. I would like to thank them for, for the time we, again, we spent together uh, for the exchange of ideas, for the discussions we made. So from this point of view, Nova School of Law is an incredible and an amazing environment. Uh, um, this you can feel that there are uh, researchers researchers from from several parts of the world. So um, yeah, Nova School of Law is really at the forefront, my opinion, of the legal research in in Europe. Um, and, and we also need to to thank you for 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 accepting our invitation of and <laughs> also offering your knowledge to, to our to our school for us it is all, always very important to to have um, mm -hmm. professors and researchers from all around the uh, europe and 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 the world uh, not to be not to be only focused in 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 portugal and in mm -hmm. our our small problems <laughs> so it is very important thank you thank you so much thank you thank you very much for uh, so for your invitation it was really Big pleasure, big pleasure to, to be with you. Thank you so much. And now it's my time to change the subject a little bit. <laughs> Mr. Consumer, do you feel <laughs> protected in Portugal? Have you had any problems? And my last question will be, how do you compare consumer protection in Portugal and Italy? Hard question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, honestly, uh, I, I did not have problem in Portugal, uh, so I I was lucky uh, uh, in this respect. Uh, I'm not really acquainted with Portugal consumer law. Um, well, I, I can say that uh, Portugal is a more the Portugal consumer law, as far as I know. But Jorge is uh, is. Uh, is uh, an expert in this in this respect so you can help me to answer the question but uh, um, well i would say that um, both of them portugal and italy have a common a common uh, uh, roots which uh, obviously is the european union uh, european private law and so um, the european consumer law uh, and uh, um, Italy is, is quite, again, it's more than from this point of view. And uh, um, yes, I would say that uh, both of them are quite, quite uh, take care of the consumer. So, <laughs> but no, I mean, I'm not a big expert of consumer, uh, Portugal consumer, consumer law. I did not have any problem uh, in in Portugal in this month, but that's, that's good. good. That that's good. You yeah. have you had an experience in Portugal uh, with uh, consumer law in practice. Exactly. <laughs> Very good. That in uh, in several months you 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 did not you did not did not have any any problem. I will hope it wasn't like you said. 
just luck. <laughs> <laughs> I hope no, no. That, that no, no. All of those who visit us and all Portuguese no, 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 no. consumers will have this experience. I think the situation is much is much better in the uh, now than it was uh, 10 or 20 years or 20 years ago. I think consumer law in practice is more. Uh, Consumer law is more is is more applied today than it was uh, mm. than it was before. It mm -hmm. more known by the by the organizations. It is more mm. known by the also by the judges, uh, and by the and by the the lawyers. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, I think it is better. But we all we well, always want to ask those who visit us what are their perspectives. My my feeling yes. is that it's they they important to know. Yeah, no, you, my feeling is that you have a good level of consumer protection. When I, uh, when I acted as a consumer, I uh, felt uh, to be, yes, protected. So the same in Italy, maybe in Italy depends on the, on the, on the, on the part of Italy, because there are some parts who in are Napoli, more, In Napoli, totally. With, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, this is just an impression. Uh, but yes, mm, honestly, my feeling was totally good about about the level of, of consumer protection in Portugal. Thank you so much, Professor Luigi. Finally, who would you recommend we interview in a future episode of our podcast? Maybe, maybe you can interview. I don't know. Maybe Nausica Palazzo, Professor Palazzo. Uh, or Veronica Corcodel, uh, I spent time with them, or Fabrizio Esposito also. Who, with part uh, of our research group here at the okay. Nova Consumer Lab. Okay, and uh, so yes, uh, I spent time with them and uh, I think that uh, if you interview them, it's a good opportunity for everyone. And so we come to the end of the third season of the Nova Consumer Podcast. Thank you very much to our, all our listeners. As always, you can send us your, as your questions to Nova Consumer Lab at novalaw.unl.pt and follow us on social media. See you soon in season four. Bye.